Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. This is the Speaker Spotlight series from Region 6. And today we're pleased to host Carrie C. Hornbuckle. She will be speaking about sources of airborne PCBs in schools. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees have been muted, but we do welcome your questions and comments in the chat box at any time. Miles, uh, our communications and finance coordinator is providing technical assistance today and he'll be keeping an eye on the chat with me. Please be sure to select everyone from the drop down menu when posting your questions in chat to ensure both Miles and I see them and can pass them along to Carrie. There will also be time for questions at the end. Closed caption has been enabled and it's available by clicking on the icon with the three dots and then selecting closed caption. We're recording today's session and we'll post it on NNLM's YouTube channel in one to two weeks. This class is eligible for one Medical Library Association continuing education credit, which you'll be able to claim through the evaluation link and enrollment code that we share with you at the end of the session. And speaking of evaluation, uh, your feedback helps us improve future training. So please take a moment to complete that uh, after the presentation. This webinar is brought to you by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Uh, the National Library of Medicine, NLM, is one of 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources such as PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM, the network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM, working to ensure health professionals and the public have access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. Uh, today's session is organized by Region 6 as part of our Speaker Spotlight series. Uh, we are lucky to have with us today as a guest speaker, Carrie C. Hornbuckle. Carrie is the Donald E. Bentley Professor of Engineering and Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Iowa. She is on the faculty of the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Human Toxicology and a research engineer at IIHR Hydroscience and Engineering. She is the director of the uh, Iowa Superfund Research Program, a multi-project research center funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Now I'm going to hand it over to Carrie for the presentation. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you for the invitation to speak to this group. It's, um, it's really an honor and um, I look forward to hearing uh, your perspective uh, on the work that we're doing. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, a variety of topics. Don't hesitate to inter interrupt me at any time, either uh, through the chat or other ways. Um, Nora, if you see a question come through in the chat, and you think appropriate to inter interrupt me to draw attention to it, please do. I'm happy uh, to discuss as we go along. So let's see if I can share my screen properly. Okay, how does how does that look? Can you see the, the full screen of my title slide? Looks good. All right, great. So the work I'm going to talk about today is largely a product of the Iowa Superfund Research Program. It's a research center that's funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in their Superfund Research Program. The Superfund Research Program um, is a portion of the funding that originally was provided to EPA to help support remediation um, of contaminated waste, waste sites that didn't have clear owners. A portion of that money was given to the National Institute of Health and the Superfund Research Program at NIEHS has supported um, uh, about 20 research centers across the United States that uh, examine the research associated with Superfund sites or Superfund chemicals. 
Our center at the Iowa Superfund Research Program has been funded since 2006 for this work, and our current uh, title is Airborne PCBs, Sources, Exposures, Toxicities, and Remediation. Um, we recently have been doing quite a bit of work about PCB metabolism, so I insert that, even that's not though it's not an official title at this time. So we study polychlorinated biphenyls, and they're rather famous compounds. They were um, among the very first compounds that were banned by the new US EPA when it was created in 1970. And in 1979, these chemicals were banned from production and sales because of emerging evidence of their toxicity to humans, um, animals, and ecosystems. So these chemicals um, were uh, produced and sold uh, by Monsanto as mixtures called aerochlores. And these mixtures of PCBs were used in many different applications, including uh, in transformers and light capacitors, um, like shown here, and um, also in copyless or uh, carbonless copy paper, um, and many other applications. About 3 billion pounds of these aerochlores were produced, and all of the uses of those aerochlores are not known. So in about the middle part of the last decade, 2015 and thereabouts, uh, uh, the World Health Organization um, organized a review of PCB carcinogenicity and assembled a team of international experts to assess all of the toxicology data for PCBs concerning cancer. PCBs are one of the most studied um, environmental toxicants, um, in part because of the severe regulatory approach the EPA took in banning their production and sales, um, but also because researchers have continually found new ways that PCBs uh, cause toxic outcomes in humans and animals. And uh, this report from IARC concluded that PCBs are indeed the highest level of carcinogens. They're known human carcinogens. So the Iowa Superfund Research Program has been part of the um, international leadership in examining these, these compounds and, in fact, participated in that discussion that concluded PCBs are carcinogens. Um, but our work continues because of the identification of PCBs holding many other toxic properties, including effects on our neurological system, immune system, and endocrine system, and metabolic systems. So our center, though, is focused on a particular aspect of PCBs, and that's their presence in air. Originally, it was not expected that PCBs would be in air because they um, accumulate in fats and lipids. They weren't expected to be volatile, but because of the magnitude of their presence, um, the magnitude of their original production, um, even a little bit that escapes to the air ends up being significant for um, human exposure. And indeed, that's happened. So our center focuses on PCBs that are found in air, partly because that research area uh, was not really well understood and, until we began our work. Currently, we're focusing on adolescents, also because the information about the effect of PCBs on adolescents is, is limited but alarming, um, on, and also because they're recently been discovered to have unusually high exposures to PCBs, which I'll talk about a little bit more today. We are also interested in the processes that affect and are affected by the metabolism of PCBs in the human body. And we want to prioritize um, decision making around all these questions about what are the most important contributors to the human health risk for continuing exposure to these chemicals. We want to focus on the issues that are most important and provide the most uh, vital research information that helps regulators, policymakers, decision makers, and individuals um, reduce human risk to these chemicals. So this cartoon illustrates the kind of work that our center does overall. Um, all the arrows indicate research that we do about the emissions of PCBs. And that's what I mean by, by the sources of PCBs. 
We look at the release from contaminated sediments. We look at the conversion by microbes to other chemicals in the sediments. We look at how they're released in urban areas from many surfaces, especially from historical industrial use. But we also look at interiors of buildings because aerochlorous were purposefully added to the building materials, partly as uh, flame retardants, but also because they um, change the nature of materials it was mixed into, like paint or adhesive or caulking. It helped preserve the material um, and also preserved its um, elasticity. It was like a plasticizer. Well, they're used in schools, and so we are interested in their effect on people in schools, including adolescents. And then we are interested in how people absorb these chemicals and what happens inside the body. We're a, a community of researchers. Um, we're a relatively large research center. There's about 50 of us all together. And we have um, five major research projects that we pursue. And um, we're in the middle of our five-year funding for these projects. We have one about um, uh, adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. We have one about the effect of PCBs on, on the meta metabolic syndrome and the way that humans manage um, energy. We have one about the exposures that people have um, on their day-to-day. -day. This is a cohort study. Um, the study I lead is one about sources and emissions of PCBs, and we also have a project about mitigating PCBs and sediments. And then surrounding these projects, we have laboratories, we have statisticians, we have community engagement experts, and we have um, a program of training new uh, environmental health scientists. We're from many different disciplines at the University of Iowa, um, including the health sciences and engineering and public policy and public health. Um, the centerpiece for me, because I'm an engineer and also a chemist and an environmental modeler, is our laboratory. Um, so our laboratory uh, is responsible for measuring the PCBs in all the studies that we do, including the studies we do in schools, including animal studies, including the cohort studies of people. We analyze um, PCBs in air and water and sediment in plant tissue, in soils, in human blood, in the tissues of laboratory animals, and even in uh, human tissues like um, brain tissue. And we have a, a program that allows us to handle many samples. We have a high capacity for um, very high uh, quality measurements of PCBs. Um, and so we, because of this um, uniform approach that we take, we're able to more easily compare PCBs in different media than is usually the case because of the rigor of our, our methods. So we use uh, tandem mass spectrometry to do this. And one of the things that this method provides to us is information about each one of the PCBs. You see there's 209 different PCB chemicals. And the aerochlores that were produced by Monsanto and were used in schools and other places consist of a large number of those diff of different collections of those compounds, usually 150 or more. And so each one of those has its own unique properties, especially including toxicity. And so it's important that we try to separate them all and, and analyze each one of those in all of those samples we, we handle in, my, in our laboratory. And there's 209 and there's almost 200 different peaks showing here. And, and each one is from a chromatogram from our in instrument showing that we can separate the PCBs according to how many chlorines are on the molecule. This is what the molecule looks like generically, but for each one, these chlorines are at a different location on these biphenyl rings and there's different numbers of chlorines. In general, the ones with only one or two or three chlorines are more volatile, while the ones with um, eight, nine, ten chlorines tend to accumulate more in humans and are more resistant to breakdown. So we have a program of analysis and also interpretation that's highly integrated. 
In fact, we combine our meetings for the group of chemists who do the analysis with the group of statisticians who try to interpret um, and manage the data. And so this this picture is a reflection of one day of our meetings where the people who are interested in both of those questions, analytical chemistry and the data management statistics come together. Um, and through this kind of collaboration, we we're able to make many discoveries. So today I wanna to structure my talk around what we thought we knew about PCBs and what we know now as a result of research. Um, what that research provided was new methods and new methods that our center introduced helped change the view that uh, scientists now have about PCBs. And we are hopeful <laughs> that policymakers and regulators um, will pay attention so that they can make more um, appropriate, cost effective um, and meaningful uh, changes to reduce human exposure. OK, so. Here's what we thought we knew. There's a lot of misinformation about PCBs and a lot of it's because the research wasn't there to provide another view. But so, okay, here's my list of what we thought we knew, but now we know is not true. Okay, we used to think that PCBs were banned from production. We used to think PCBs were banned from use. We used to think PCBs are no longer entering the environment that they're non-volatile and the gas phase is not important. We used to think that living near a PCB waste site is the worst case for human exposure. We used to think that humans got PCBs through their diet, especially eating fish, and that was the main route of exposure. We used to think that only dioxin-like PCBs are toxic. We used to think that PCBs did not break down or metabolize. We used to think that the lower molecular weight, more volatile PCBs did not cause any harm. And we um, used to think that the legislation, CERCLA, that provides a means to clean up PCBs and actually Sarah, another major legislation to reduce human exposure was the way we should deal with these chemicals in the environment. And I'm going to talk today about why these, these, fi these assumptions are no longer valid. So one of the methods that we introduced early, starting in 2006, we realized that we needed a method to more carefully, efficiently, and accurately measure airborne PCBs in urban areas. So we built this sampler that was on the, we put on the back of two health clinic vans that worked in the city of Chicago. And every day, they would collect an air sample for us. This is our our system, it's called a high vol. It's got a vacuum pump and it pulls air through a filter and then through an absorbent, allowing us to capture PCBs that are on particles and PCBs that are in the gas phase. Um, and so this would be operating all day that the, that the clinic van was there and mostly they are at schools. They'd stop at the school and they'd provide medical services to the low income families that um, had children at that school. It was mostly focused on asthma, but it also provided general medical services. Well, they'd sit at the location, they turn off their gas engine, and then they collect a sample for me. And using this method, we collected hundreds of samples across the city of Chicago that we analyzed for PCBs. And one of the first discoveries we made was of a non aerochlor uh, called PCB11. And this is 3 3 prime dichlorobiphenyl. And it's a result of our novel methods that we use to detect and measure PCBs in urban air. And I'll talk a little bit more about that chemical in the future. But my favorite air sampler um, that we helped uh, improve the design for was one called a um, polyurethane foam passive air sampler. And it looks like this, it looks, it is like two inverted metal discs, uh, metal um, like salad bowls with some holes drilled in it. And inside, there's a bar in which sits a piece of polyurethane foam. It's the same materials we have in our furniture. It absorbs airborne PCBs really well. It looks like these discs, and we can clean them before we put them out. And then we leave them out in place at a location for about six weeks. And so at all those school sites where we were measuring the outdoor concentration using those van samplers, we replaced them with these passive samplers. They were cheaper and easier to manage. And they gave us a different picture of PCBs. Instead of a one day um, measurement of airborne PCBs, it was integrated over the whole six weeks and it stood out there. But the question that we had to deal with when comparing those methods was, well, what's the volume of air that's collected by a passive sampler? There's no pump and so there's no flow rate. 
all there is is passive flow of air through here. But when you measure the PCBs on this disk, you have to divide it by some volume. So we developed a new method to do that. And that was one of the early methods of, of my laboratory that really contributed to how we understand PCBs in the environment. We did many studies about this, about how these samplers work, including designing um, fluid dynamic models for rooms. And this is an illustration of how we, we learn to understand how air moves around our samplers inside and outside. Um, and that gave us uh, an ability to more precisely use these to determine the accurate concentration uh, inside a room. And we also developed a, a model that users could, could use when they deployed their samplers anywhere in the world. It's a web-based model, and the user can click at any location in the world and um, identify the time period that the sampler was out. And we, using meteorological data that we, um, we gathered from NASA and NOAA and other agencies, are able to then predict the flow rate and the sampling volume with that sampler. This was part of work that we did with Environment Canada for their um, obligations to the Stockholm Convention. So PCBs in air are mostly from aerochlores, historical uh, use of these mixtures that Monsanto sold until they were banned in 1979. And what I've shown here are some examples of four different mixtures that were sold for different purposes. What this, these bar graphs look like is this is the distribution of PCBs in that mixture. They're organized from the lowest molecular weight to the highest molecular weight. And then I've identified the, the trade name for that mixture. And they're plotted as a mass fraction. So you can sort of see that this mixture, Aerochlorus 1016, has a lot of low molecular weight PCBs and hardly any of those with a lot of chlorines on it. While this mixture, Aer Aerochlor 1254, has a lot more of the higher molecular weight ones and not many of the lower molecular weight ones. Well, Monsanto did that on purpose because they were, this is an advertisement from about 1954, um, because they were selling these products for different uses. Aerochlor 1254 here was used for liquid phase heat transfer systems, and that was this one here. And um, so they use them for many, so they were sold and used in many different applications, all of which we don't know. But when we measure them in air, we find most of the PCBs are from aerochlores historical. They're still hanging around. But some of them are from non aerochlores And I call them, some people call them, sometimes I do too, non-legacy sources. And it turns out that some chemical manufacturing processes that are used right now produce PCBs by accident or as byproducts. Um, and examples are PCB11, and that was the chemical that we discovered right away when we did the sampling in Chicago. We were surprised at this chemical because it's not a very important component of any of the aerochlores. Well, it turns out it's associated with the production of uh, brightly colored yellow pigment that's used in household paint. Um, but other PCBs are also present in brightly colored pigments used in household paint, like PCB3 is in blue paint, and PCB52 is in red paint. And we reported our findings um, when we here, in, I live in Iowa City, and um, my team went to one of the local hardware stores, and you know how there's a carousel of pigments you can buy when, you, when you're buying a a gallon of paint. They'll make any color you want by combining these pigments. So we just, we, they, we talked them into selling us the direct, the pigment itself. Um, and all the major manufacturers of paint had PCVs in those pigments. And that explained why we saw this in Chicago air. In fact, it turns out that byproduct production of PCVs is, is an important source of PCVs in the environment. We started getting more interested in indoor air and the sources of PCBs indoors, um, in part because of discovering this um, presence of these PCBs in paint. Um, so here, for example, we reported the concentrations of PCBs in different colorants by color. Um, and finding that green paint, ironically, right, has the highest concentration of these toxic chemicals. Um, and so after 
you know, learning this, that these brightly colored paints have them. And by the way, gray paint, white paint, black paint, brown paint doesn't have PCBs in it because they don't use a chemical process that produces these chemicals by, by accident. We started wondering how these, how the paint PCBs become emitted from surfaces, like after you paint your walls. Maybe you painted your your nursery brightly colored yellow. Is that a significant source and how long is that? Is it only a source while the paint dries or is it a source as long as that yellow paint is there? So we designed a new sampler called a um, polyurethane foam passive emission sampler. And it works by um, putting a clean piece of polyurethane foam in a glass Petri dish and holding it in place so that there's a gap between the surface and the polyurethane foam. When we put that on a surface and let it sit there for about six weeks and any PCB gases that desorb from the, the surface then are captured by our polyurethane foam. And because we know the area, the time that it's been there, we can calculate emission rate from that. And so we use that in lots of places, including the kitchen. And we found that in addition to emissions from newly painted paint, there's also emissions from newly finished um, cabinets. This kitchen cabinet mixture, as we now come to call it, is as a result of the chemical manufacturing of silicone polymers. And in that, that chemical manufacturing process also produces a certain particular set of PCBs. And we can see it in new finished cabinets, but not in cabinets that have been in place five years. And since then, we've been able to show that this source of PCBs is only important shortly after the application of that surface, shortly after it's been painted or shortly after the sealant has been applied. But within, you know, five years, it's pretty much not observable. Now, the time in between there depends a lot on the ventilation of the room um, and what other sources of PCBs are in there to tell whether um, these non-intentional uh, PCBs are important. Our work has shown conclusively about how what the manufacturing process is, and we published what we think was the, the chemical mechanism that produced uh, three PCB conjures from silicone rubber manufacturing. And we, our hypothesis about how this work turned out to be correct. And in uh, worldwide, this has had um, significant impact. In fact, in Germany, um, they closed down the, the process for about 11 silicone rubber manufacturing plants and made them change how they do this cross-linking process so that they don't produce PCBs by accident. And this is because they found these particular PCBs in the in the vegetables of the gardens and the people's homes surrounding their plants. Okay, so we've learned that PCBs are uh, coming in the environment because of historical use of aerochlores and modern and continuing production of non-aerochlores from manufacturing. And we've found that um, many uh, PCBs we measure in the environment are from that could come from either source. And so it's been an interesting challenge for us to try to separate. When we measure PCBs in the air, we wanna know which ones are coming from which kind of sources because our center is focused on remediation. So we've used, uh, we've benefited from having this collaboration between the chemists and the statisticians, and we have been able to do so to separate um, the, the relative contributions from historical and modern sources. And we found that um, non-aerochlor sources, that is modern PCBs, explain maybe 15% of the PCBs that we measure in ambient outdoor air. In indoor, it's a different story because it depends greatly on the, the way that the building was, in, was, was originally constructed, whether aerochlors were originally used, um, Buildings that were built after 1980 didn't use aerochlor, so there's an interesting and important cutoff um, between buildings that were that were built before 1980 and those after. In buildings built after 1980, you can see that most of the PCBs in the room in the spaces indoors can often come from these um, byproduct PCBs. But in buildings that were built before aerochlors were banned in 1980, almost 90 90 or more percent come from 
the, his, the historical use of air cores that still remain in those buildings. Okay, so I want to go back to my original list of what we thought we knew. And I've now showed you that PCBs are not banned from production. They're still produced uh, during chemical manufacturing. PCBs are not banned from use. Even aerochlores are not banned from use. Aerochlor PCBs, those three billion pounds that were produced, a lot of them are still in place. They were um, added to caulking and adhesives. Um, and paint in buildings and in buildings that haven't been seriously remodeled, a lot of that is still there. And we did not ban that from use. Um, actually, there was no legal decision um, to remove the PCBs that had already been put in place. So it's not true that PCBs are not entering the environment. They still are. And if you work or go to school in a building built before 1980, it's likely that you're experiencing high concentrations of those PCBs that are still there. Um, it's not true that they're not volatile. In fact, PCBs come into the air in a significant way. So now I want to look at the last ones. So let's see how important is this uh, situation. So our center has been um, designing new methods uh, to, to better understand human exposures, toxicity, and, and the routes of exposure. And we've conducted studies with cohorts of uh, people who've uh, agreed to participate in our study, including a study in rural Iowa and in Northwest Indiana. We recruited um, adolescent children and their moms to um, place air samplers in their homes and outside their homes. And we recruited them to provide blood samples so we could look at their exposures in their blood. Um, we've also given them surveys and asked them to tell us what they eat and where they work and where they go to where they go to school um, and how they spend their day. Um, and so then we recruited the schools to participate and we put air samplers inside and outside their schools. Um, for their blood samples, we found a surprising outcome that the concentration of PCBs in the blood from rural, a rural cohort of moms and kids was not statistically different in concentration overall compared to urban industrial North, Northwest Indiana. And that really surprised us because we thought that rural Iowa would have lower levels because there's a PCB, known PCB source in um, northeast, northwest Indiana. Um, there's a lot of industrial historical pollution of PCBs. So then we started to try to look at where, how the people were exposed. And from the air samplers, these people hosted in their, in their homes, we found that the homes were not a major source, but the schools were a big source. We were very surprised. We found um, that this concentrations of PCBs in schools was higher than we found in homes. And like I've noted here in the front page of one of our papers, we found concentrations inside schools were one to two orders of magnitude higher than immediately outside, even in the highly industrialized PCB polluted town of, of East Chicago, Indiana. And the concentrations range from 0 0.5 to 195 nanograms per cubic meter. Well, so why are PCBs in schools? And th our study here, which, which is, this is what is, uh, I think we, this one came out in 2017, really surprised us. Why are PCBs higher in schools than other places? In fact, the levels that are, we found in schools are higher than I had ever measured outside, even right next to a major PCB Superfund site. For example, we did um, uh, major studies in New Bedford Harbor, Massachusetts, which is a super fun site about PCBs, and in the Fox River in Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is um, uh, also p heavily um, PCB contaminated system. And the concentrations we measured in air were never as high as what we measured in several schools. So PCBs are in schools, like I said before, because they were used in caulking. They were added purposefully to the caulking. Um, they are also used in light, uh, fluorescent light ballasts. And this is an example of one. Um, and they're used in the capacitors. Um, and they're purposefully added to almost every fluorescent light ballast that was produced until um, the late 70s. And so now if you look at your fluorescent lights, you can find it'll say PCB free. But if it doesn't say PCB free and it's an old one, um, then it has PCBs in it. 
and that's a source of PCBs in, in the indoor environment. Unfortunately, the sales of aerochlorous for these kind of uses directly coincide with the rise of the public school construction during the baby boom post-war baby boom generation between 1950 and 1980. So there's more than um, 50,000 schools that are thus affected. Um, there is no uh, clear federal policy for how to decide if the concentrations of PCBs are in too high, and there's no regulation that says whether they must be remediated. Um, EPA does not specifically re regulate airborne concentrations of PCBs indoors. They do provide um, a guidance, this exposure levels for evaluating PCBs in school indoor air, about what concentrations are of concern. And as I described before, Concentrations we measured in some schools exceeded um, 100 nanograms per cubic meter, so are certainly in that range of concern, according to EPA. Um, but in 2021, in Vermont, their legislature required that all their schools that were built or renovated prior to 1980 be tested for PCBs in indoor air, and they developed school action levels um, that were uh, more stringent than what EPA had set and they released action levels of what the schools have to do. Like if they find concentrations of PCBs in a pre-kindergarten room that's 30 nanograms per cubic meter or more, they can no longer use that room for pre-kindergartners. Um, similarly, you know, if they find higher than 100 nanograms per cubic meter in a junior high and high school room, they can no longer use that room for um, that age group. And so that's been dramatic. Um, and, and recognition of the serious um, health issues associated with exposure to PCBs, especially for uh, children. So we've been um, assisting Vermont uh, and the EPA and, and others in a better understanding, providing research to better understand this. And we used our passive air samplers uh, to start to look more specifically at the sources of PCBs in schools. So, for example, we've been placing samplers in individual school rooms to try to understand the difference room to room and what materials in each room are providing are contributing. And I mean, we hypothesize that it's possible we, that localized remediation of specific materials uh, could reduce the concentrations significantly. Um, we've also developed the methods to use our passive emission samplers uh, in school rooms. And so we've been uh, measuring the emissions directly off different materials and surfaces in schools to try to identify if there's um, straightforward and simple and cost effective mechanisms to control the emissions of PCBs. What we're finding is that there is indeed room to room differences indicating that different rooms have different materials with different levels of PCBs um, emitting, which is promise to the um, opportunities for reducing uh, PCB exposure. Right now, without uh, these research findings, the EPA's approach um, and the consultants that you know serve schools who are trying to re re do remediation is largely tearing down the building. In fact, and in Vermont, part of the reason that this legislation happened is because Burlington High School was found to have very high levels of PCBs and the community decided to tear the whole building down and rebuild their high school because of PCB contamination. And now uh, high school students in Burlington, Vermont are going to school in an, in an old Macy's uh, while their school is um, intended to be torn down and is sitting empty. So our center also includes toxicology studies, and we have been since 2006 earnestly trying to provide the research data to fill the gaps in what, what we need to know about the, um, the toxicity due to inhalation of PCBs. And this is the most recent paper that we published about a, an animal study. So we use laboratory animals to examine um, how people uh, the, to control the exposure and then look for the specific effects. And this particular study was is the best we've designed yet 
for trying to mimic the in, the environmental exposure in schools. It's a 91 day, but it's repeated, meaning that the animals are exposed for about four hours a day, only during weekdays and for 91 days. So although it's not as long as a child would be exposed, it's a longer time than a single one-time exposure. And then we try to evaluate whether there's any indication of harm. Well, we found in our study that PCB exposure impaired memory, induced anxiety-like behavior, significantly reduced white blood cell counts, mildly disrupted metabolic me metabolomics in plasma, and influenced transcription processes in the brain with 274 upregulated and 58 downregulated genes. Um, this work and others done by our group and, and others in the, in the United States and internationally are, have shown conclusively that PCBs do cause neurological impacts, and um, including those associated with the symptoms of ADHD and autism. Now, unfortunately, there's not a huge amount of data about how this works, and a great deal of work is being done at our laboratory and others to try to connect the dots between the mechanisms of causing neurological damage and the outcomes that are exhibited in behavior. Um, recently, we reported um, a, a review study that showed that um, much needs to be learned about the effect of PCB exposure during adolescence. But rat studies have shown that um, PCB exposure caused disruptions in the main functions of the prefrontal cortex, resulting in, co in co cognitive deficits. We, there's an urgent need for us to understand better how this happens. One of the challenges of studying PCBs is trying to figure out how people have been exposed and what level. And um, traditionally, that's done through measurement of PCBs in the blood. But our center has shown that PCBs are rapidly metabolized to other chemicals. And in fact, it used to be assumed that the lower molecular weight conjures were not toxic because they disappeared so quickly from the body. But we've shown that really what happens is they get metabolized into other chemicals. And, our, and we have developed new methods to actually measure those chemicals in human blood and have shown from our cohort studies in Indiana and Iowa that the evidence of um, their known exposure through air is found in the presence of the PCB metabolites in their bodies. Those metabolites are contributors to the toxicity associated with PCBs. But at this point, it's hard to separate the toxicity, toxicity caused by the parent PCB from the metabolite because the metabolites themselves have not been studied in detail separately. And our center is leading the way on those kinds of studies. Okay, so what do we know now about PCBs and PCB exposure in schools? Well, we know that PCBs are byproducts of chemical manufacturing, so still produced. We know that PCB removal from those historical uses has not been uniformly required. In fact, PCB emissions are effectively uncontrolled here in the United States. Um, PCBs are emitted from the, in the gas phase, um, and they're emitted from any surfaces that are, uh, that where these chemicals are present or were used. I no longer think that living next to a PCB contaminated waste site is the worst case for human exposure. I now think that school air is the major route of serious and harmful um, exposure to humans. I now know because of our own studies that diet is not the me main mechanism for exposure for many people, especially for children who go to school in older schools that have not been remodeled and don't eat fish, which actually characterizes our cohort study community in Indiana and, and Iowa. Their exposure through inhalation is just as important, if not more important, than their dietary exposure. It used to be thought that only the dioxin-like PCBs are, are toxic, but now it's plenty of data to show their hormone disruptors, neurotoxicants, they're associated with metabolic disease, and as a set are known human carcinogens. We now know PCBs break down to a series of other metabolites, and these cause their own toxic properties. It's now known that we can't categorize PCB harm or toxicity in lower molecular weight and higher molecular weight. They all exert toxicity. 
The challenge is um, identifying the metabolic processes that are part of the observed effect that we see in laboratory animals. Lastly, I have learned that although Superfund legislation, which I'm a, our research is a benefit from, has really been designed to clean up um, contaminated waste sites outdoors and was not designed, it was not anticipated that the cleanup of schools and buildings would be important. But now we've shown how important that is for exposure. I hope that federal funds will become available for remediation of schools, because right now it's the schools, the school districts, and the communities themselves that are responsible for dealing with this big problem. So last year, I wrote an opinion piece about this because our findings from my own research really affected my view of um, PCBs. And what I noticed was that our historical view of PCBs was out of date and resulted in common misconceptions about PCBs and that that prevented us from recognizing the crisis we are now in and have been in for more than 70 years that these chemicals were used and as a result, children are exposed to these toxic chemicals. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for attending uh, this seminar. And if you have any questions, I'd be um, happy to entertain them. This work was funded uh, by the National Institute of Health, but also the state of Vermont, the US EPA and the National Science Foundation. Thank you, Carrie, for a great presentation. Um, I really appreciated that. And, and thanks to our audience for being here. Someone asked in the questions whether the studies can be shared. Well, absolutely. For all of this, um, I provided links to the, to the specific papers, but I also want to draw your attention to the Iowa Superfund Research Program's website. On our website, we have links to all the papers that we have produced since 2006. Um, and our libraries, by the way, have been instrumental in helping us organize that information. They've also helped us release our data in a free, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible way. So now a, a great deal of our research data is also available uh, free and open. Wonderful. Thanks for putting that in the chat, Miles. Yeah, thank you, Miles. What other questions do, do people have for Carrie? Um, I see a question in the chat from Lisa. Um, they wrote, have there been any studies on exposure to adults working in old office buildings? Oh, that's a really interesting question. And I think it's a valid research question. As far as I know, there has not been a, uh, such a study that's been done. There have been studies on older people who eat PCB contaminated fish. There is a series of, of very famous studies on the Great Lakes that showed memory loss associated with high um, consumption of, of fatty fish from Lake Michigan, mostly, that were contaminated with PCB. So yeah, um, memory loss with an older adults is certainly a, a recorded or recognized outcome of high PCB exposure. So yeah, I would expect in, in building older buildings that had not been remodeled, that that would also be true. Sorry about that. Makes me worry too. <laughs> Someone else says that they were worried about that too because they work in a 100 year old library and wonder about the amount of PCBs that might be floating around that building. Right, and I, I've been very curious about that kind of scenario too. So a hundred year old building ought to be good because um, when it was built, they weren't putting PCBs in, in those buildings, right? Um, not until about 1950 did that begin. Um, and then it ceased by 1980. And so really what it is, what did they do during that PCB era? Did they remodel and, and use what was the modern construction with added PCBs during that time or not? You know, it's... Um, difficult to predict. We've we've studied schools that were that age and found high levels because they remodeled during that period and put in PCBs and then didn't remodel much after and so they remained, right? Wow. Yeah. 
in the Q&A, um, someone asks, how aware are states and school systems of this concern? Do you have any? Well, over the last couple of years, the attention has certainly been increasing. Um, there was a, a really nice study or a um, summary of the problem in Education Week um, last fall, where the writer, the, the the magazine provided to their, it's a subscription magazine, mostly to, you know, school officials and, and um, targeting, you know, facilities. They really laid it out. Um, I thought it was a wonderful, it's worth looking at the Education Week um, articles. But then there's also been some lawsuits that um, uh, families of PCB contaminated schools um, against Monsanto and uh, a couple of them, including um, two I was involved in, ended up with large settlement or well decisions, jury decisions against Monsanto for negligence in the in, in you know the sale of these materials. And then you have Vermont, which their legislature. Uh, decided that they should measure the PCBs in all their schools because of the realization of this problem. And then way before that, um, schools across the country, some things would happen like a parent for some reason would decide to make measurements and they would discover this. And this happened in wealthy districts um, that then um, the school district decided to tear down the school. Noted ones were in Connecticut. There was one in California in um, a wealthy district in California where, um, you know, it was paid for by parents who were concerned. But now that, you know, we're seeing this situation fall, fall out and our research is showing how likely prevalent this problem is, um, it doesn't mean it's uniform. You know, some schools are a lot worse than other schools. And we're trying to develop a, a database to better predict that, you know, right now it appears to me that poor districts are much more likely to have higher levels of PCBs because they haven't remodeled significantly since 1980. Um, also, many of those districts have schools that were built during the PCB era. So that combination, you know, of when it was built and how much it was remodeled you know, is a predictor of high levels, probably, although we don't have enough data to be able to be conclusive about that. And you lay on top of that, those districts being least able to deal with this problem because it's the schools and the school districts that are responsible for their facilities. There's not a federal program to help them with this, with this. So, you know, Burlington, Vermont decided to tear down their high school because of it. Um, That's just not a um, avenue available to to every school. How interesting. Um, Sheila asks, if public facing, can the lawsuits be shared? Well, there's a lot of articles. You can Google them. You'll find a lot of information about the um, the ones I'm most aware of are the ones in Washington State, and um, but then there's there's probably. Yes, I mean there's there's lawsuits in Vermont too, um, mostly I think associated with that uh, high school situation. So yeah, there's a there's a great great uh, there's a driving understanding of this problem, and I'm very feel very strongly that first of all it's a big problem and it needs to be addressed. I'm. I mean, it's been in place for a long time, so it's not like it's a it's a new problem. But now that we understand it and it's been sort of hidden from us all this time, I think we're obligated um, to address it. Um, the link to ADHD and other neurological um, disorders in children is really an important problem that maybe we could, you know, improve or help if if we do this work that otherwise is really needed, like it's not just about PCBs, but also many schools need better ventilation, you know, to deal with, you know, COVID and and other communicable diseases or some schools that live near wildfire smoke that need better systems of, uh, of improving the quality of indoor air. And then energy efficiency, right? Lots of schools um, haven't replaced their windows that the caulking still contain PCBs, but those windows are also letting in a lot of, you know, air and heat exchange 
that um, makes it more expensive to operate. So there's multiple reasons why an investment in, in uh, school infrastructure will benefit the, the health of the students and the people who work there. The last question that I see here is, do slash did you test for PCBs in buildings at the University of Iowa or buildings of other universities and college campuses that you may collaborate with? Yes, we we have made measurements at the University of Iowa. In fact, I showed a cartoon of airflow in a room around the passive air samplers, and that was my office. <laughs> at that time, I was in an office with no windows and only one ventilation, and so it was really great to model. It wasn't great to work in, but it was really great to model. So we set up our air samplers and calibrated that system in my office. And yeah, we found pretty high concentrations, I mean, higher than you'd see outside, in, in my building, and my building is more than 100 years old, and clearly those materials were brought in, you know, after construction. Um, then we also have a collaboration with the University of Iowa to study an older building that was built during the PCB era, and we're using um, that building to examine the specific importance of carpet and wallboard and ventilation, um, in, in more detail and and that work is ongoing and in review uh, at a peer reviewed journal right now. Thanks for asking. And then the follow up question to that someone asks, did you check Harden Library? Harden Library open. <laughs> no, we have not done hard Harden Library, although it does look like a building that was built during that era. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, it could have high PCB levels in it. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe you all can collaborate. Um, I see that we're approaching the end of our time. So thank you, Carrie, for a great presentation. I know I certainly learned a lot um, and for sharing about your work. Well, thank you. It was my honor to get to talk to you all today. So um, for everybody in attendance, um, the link for the class evaluation is on the slide there. Um, and we'd really appreciate if you would fill it out. Um, that will also bring you to, um, to a screen that will let you claim your CE code. And the enrollment code for that is on the screen. We'll also post it in the chat box. Um, so thank you again. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.